Hello, and welcome to Let's Connect. I'm Glenna Crooks, and on this show, we'll explore the connections that we have with one another, why they're important at every stage of life, and how to do it better. If you're not already connected to somebody with a food allergy, well, stand by. You soon will be. One in 13 children have food allergies. That's two in every classroom, seven on every school bus, assuming parents allow them to ride a bus, and one in every scout troop. What's more, increasing numbers of children are being diagnosed. And an increasing number of reactions are occurring. Insurance claims are up more than 300% over a span of seven years. Now, we adults and seniors, we're not in the clear. Food allergies can occur at any time of life. An increasing number of adults are having first-time reactions, too. Today's guest, Tammy Gingras moore knows these challenges well. Tammy, welcome, and thanks for being here today. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, to begin, I'd like our audience to know something about you and your family and your experience with food allergies in daily life. Tell me about that. Sure. So... I'm the mother of a wonderful 12-year-old boy. Um, my husband and I had no experience with food allergies anywhere in our families, with each other. Um, and then when my son was about 11 months old, uh, he got near peanut butter for the first time. And at that point, we realized that he's allergic to peanuts and tree nuts. And that was you know, very consuming. And then it wasn't until he was about eight uh, that we also learned he was allergic to dairy. Uh, so suddenly we added in dairy, which was a whole new way of living. Mm -hmm. And then just to really keep things interesting, right after we found out about his dairy, we found out that I was gluten intolerant. Uh, so we are a peanut, tree nut, dairy, and gluten family. You know, I think a lot of people won't be able to uh, make that distinguish between, dis um, distinguish between the peanuts and the tree nuts. Can you give us a list of the, what tree nuts are? Sure. So... Peanuts grow in the ground. Okay. Okay. Um, tree nuts, and there are many. Uh, there are almonds, there are pecans, there are pistachios, there's the Brazilian nut, uh, there's hazelnuts. Yeah, there, there are many different tree nuts. Um, and some people might be allergic to one or two, or for us, it's pretty much all of them. Okay. So tell me what this meant for your life every day. <laughs> wow. Um, it was overwhelming to say the least. Uh, in the beginning, I mean, we had a whole lot we needed to learn. He is contact allergic to it, meaning if I were to sit here with you and share a peanut butter sandwich and go home and see my son at five o'clock tonight without having washed my hands and touch him mm -hmm. or kiss him, he could absolutely have a reaction. Okay. And likely would. Um, so it is sort of an all-consuming. So we needed to make sure there were no peanuts or tree nuts anywhere um, near him or in our world. So that wasn't just your home because he, he was diagnosed as a baby. So you, you went through, what, daycare, preschool, babysitters, elementary school, Absolutely. and he's in middle school right now? Mm -hmm. He is in middle school. And it is. I mean, it was, it was everywhere. It's a lot of conversations. It's a lot of talking to people. Um, we were fortunate. We were able to find a nut-free daycare. Oh. Uh, so in those early years, there were no nuts allowed in that facility. Um, as a young mom, that was, you know, very reassuring at the time. But, you know, there are peanuts around. There are kids at his school that are eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So it's, you know, conversations with teachers and with the schools and the school nurse. And um, he sits at a peanut-free table. And uh, he's fortunate he has a lot of friends who are happy to join him. So then it's conversations with their parents of here's what they can bring for lunch so that they can sit with him. How does this affect uh, birthday parties and gatherings like that? And also, I'm wondering then, do you also allow him to participate in any extracurricular activities, or are you pretty much confining his life to home and school and a couple of friends? You know, and that's, you've hit on one of the biggest challenges right there. You know, I, I would love to pack him in saran wrap and put him in a little bubble and keep him safe, but that's not how I want my son to live his life either. Mm -hmm. So it's a balancing act between keeping him safe and allowing him to live freely. So yes, he does participate in after school activities. Um, very excited, very proud of him. He's in his school play right now. You know, so yes, he is out there and he is in the world. He does go to birthday parties, but again, there is a lot of conversation. We've been really blessed. A lot of good friends, very supportive. 
most people understand that they're not going to be able to have safe food for him and that he's going to come with his own. I'm going to pack him a special cupcake and, you know, snacks and everyone will wash their hands before and after eating. So they've really worked with us. So no, I do want him to go out and get to experience life. But this, there's legwork. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now this is the second time you've mentioned hand washing. Yes. And I think this is an important issue for people to understand because hand sanitizers mm. would not be good enough. No. Would you explain that a bit? Sure. So hand sanitizers, a great way to kill germs. But the proteins from frost, the peanuts and tree nuts are not removed by hand sanitizer. You need soap, water, and the vigorous motion of actually washing them off. Or a wipe, a hand wipe, would that work? I've seen some yes and some no. I okay. mean, I'd rather you used a hand wipe than nothing, mm -hmm. but if you're choosing between a hand wipe and washing hands, I mean, I prefer you to wash, but a hand wipe is certainly better than hand sanitizer or nothing. When we prepared for the show, I asked if you would bring an auto injector to show people because I think a lot of people who are, don't have food allergies in their family haven't seen one, don't know what they are. You said no. I did. I think that merits an explanation. <laughs> um, I said no because my son's auto injector has to be with him. Uh, so right now we have four auto injectors. Two of them are permanently with his school nurse. They stay there, they don't come home at night. But you mentioned riding the school bus. We do allow him to ride the bus. But that means he has to have two auto injectors with him should something happen. I mean, should there be, you know, someone who had it on the bus and a reaction happen? Um, one is not enough. Uh, sometimes the EpiPen or AviQ or auto injector doesn't work on the first time. <clears throat> you always have to have a second one available. So he has to have two with him and two with the nurse. So I was not able to get one to show you. Okay. Good reason, I can say. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I'd like to shift gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, this is an important time of the year. We're coming up on Thanksgiving, and after that, a number of other important holidays that families enjoy together. Uh, you know, people today in this country, 40% uh, of them, live on average 700 miles from where they were born and raised. Mm -hmm. And uh, Thanksgiving is the busiest travel season of the year. I'm wondering about what goes through the mind of a food allergy family, and it's not only yours, but you know many, when this season of the year rolls around and you think about the um, approaching holidays and when families are starting to sort out who's going to host the holiday and what are they right. going to bring and will it be potluck and, and that sort of thing. So uh, walk me through that process. What are the kinds of things that you're starting to think about now as a food allergy mom? Sure. Or that other moms might be? Right. Uh, you know, I was joking just yesterday with some friends of that we're kind of getting into that season, you know, the Halloween, the Thanksgiving, you know, whatever you celebrate in the winter, it's food. Food is everywhere. And this is a very stressful time of the year. Yes, of course we want to see our family and we want to spend time with them. But there is a lot of planning involved. Personal preference, and I don't know if everyone feels this way, I prefer to host whenever possible because honestly, cleaning the house, getting ready for guests and cooking is not a whole lot more work than what it takes for me to get the foods, coordinate with everybody and take it with us. And it's a lot less stressful because I have control and I like having that control. And so some of those elements, like so if someone <clears throat> said, look, I really want to do this for you even though you've said it might be more stressful <laughs> for you. Um, uh, that means they, they've, they've got to make sure all their pots and pans are washed yeah. well, that the kitchen counters are, mm -hmm. that there's no um, peanut residue on the furniture in the living room. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of the playroom. Yeah. Um, all of these places where kids take food around a house. Absolutely. So, so that's really quite a, that would be quite an effort on somebody else's part. It is. Yeah. You know, and I don't mean to imply that we never go visit family. We do. We do go down and we do see our family. But we're always aware and they always, you know, do make sure they've cleaned and are ready for us. But, you know, and depending on the allergen, um, yeah, scrubbing pots and pans. I mean, think about all the little crevices, you know, in a pan or think about all the little places and crevices on your counter where something could be hiding. 
I'm also wondering about um, the ability of someone who was not as educated as you are to read food labels and understand what would be safe or what would not, particularly in the case of your son, since it's not only peanuts and tree nuts, but also dairy. Mm -hmm. Because that, uh, I was very surprised recently, for example, to learn that milk solids are coated on some grapefruit to keep them fresher longer, but also to help them look better. Like, who would have thought that on a piece of fresh fruit that you would find dairy? Right. Uh, so maybe it would help if you could also explain something about the, the challenges and the need for food labeling. Sure. Uh, education. Sure. So on some levels, um, we say we're very lucky. Um, all of our allergies are what's considered the top eight in the United States. Mm. So they must be clearly listed on a food label if it contains that. Again, you know, there, there can be errors, uh, so I'm always cautious. Mm -hmm. Make sure you read the label, but it should be clear that it is in there. However, the law doesn't cover the facility. So you may have seen statements, something that says made in a facility that also processes, or made on shared lines with, or may contain or a label that has none of those at all. Mm -hmm. None of that's regulated. All of that's optional from the company that's putting it on there. So if it says may contain, and then lists one of his allergens, I know it's a no. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's obvious. But if there's nothing there at all, that doesn't mean it's safe. That just means they didn't say it. So if I'm in the grocery store, Shopping with me is a lot of fun. Um, I'm picking it up. I'm looking to see if it's in the ingredients. Okay, it's not in the ingredients. There's no potential statement. Okay, but I still don't know enough. Mm -hmm. Now I'm calling the company and I'm asking, do you process these in your facility? You're making phone calls from the grocery store? Absolutely. Every time. And sometimes there's not someone there to answer it, and that just means it goes back on the shelf until I have an answer. Because it's just, it's not worth the risk. Well, and something else you've pointed out is the labeling only includes these most eight common food allergens, and there are 170 food mm -hmm. allergens altogether. So people who have an allergy to one of those other foods, they're always calling, right? They absolutely are. Yeah. And there's a lot of different words for a lot of different foods, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, it, that. That is why I say, in many ways, we're very lucky that ours is the top eight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's think a little bit more about the holiday, though. Okay. Let's say that they even come to your house. All right. So you know that it's an allergen-friendly <laughs> dinner for everyone um, who's there. Uh, and nobody brought potluck. So no. you don't have to worry about something sneaking in that nobody realized. Well, you know, sometimes people really want to bring a lovely hostess gift or they, they want to contribute because they don't understand the seriousness of it. And it's really hard to be both gracious hostess and allergy protective mama. Oh. And so usually it's a thank you and I sneak it right out the garage door. Okay. My husband and I have a system for that. All right. Well, uh, well, let's say dinner's over now. Okay. And you know how it is sometimes when you're cleaning up the dishes, one of the relatives will, will offer to take the kids to a park or to a <laughs> playground and burn off some of that energy that they have. What are you thinking about now? Well, first of all, I'm really evaluating who is it. You know, is it someone who gets it? Mm -hmm. um, because there are friends, there are family who really understand and who I, I know have done this with my son many times, we're good. So if they can pass that first test, I'm like, okay, I trust you. Second thing is, here's the auto injector. Do you remember how to use it? I have a trainer. Let's use the trainer. Let's practice. You haven't seen it in a while. Okay, make sure you have this. Here's the phone. Do you know the process? You know if it's something happens. Here's signs. Call 911. Use it. Don't feed him. <laughs> and, and that's sort of the last thing, you know, it's like, don't feed my child. That's it. They're, don't. Just don't. Uh, some playgrounds are actually carry signs mm -hmm. and notices about not having food. Are those available in your area? I haven't found any yet. Um, now, again, he's, he's getting a little bit out of the playground stage, so I haven't really looked lately. Uh, but I think that is a wonderful idea because I have heard of people whose children reacted on the playground. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's easy enough to do. You eat something, you have a snack, you touch something, and 
I mean, it's, it's easy enough to see how it can happen, so I think it's great. Okay, all right. Well, now I want to ask you a really tough question. Um, let's assume that despite all of your care and caution and vigilance and best efforts, s uh, something happens, not mm -hmm. just yours, but any other food allergy family, uh, that something happens and a child reacts. Now, as the parent, you know what to do. Right? You've been trained. I, I'd like to think so. I, I have to admit, we have never had an emergency emergency. Um, so I'm hoping I will remember all the training and things we've practiced. Okay, in that moment. Yes. It could be a, a bit of panic. A little yeah. bit. Um, but if there are other people around, you know, there, I don't know if there's anything that they can do or not, but what would you suggest? What would be the best and most supportive thing that you would suggest they do in order to be supportive of you and your son? Sure. First of all, I want one person dialing 911. Mm -hmm. Handle that especially the person who lives there. You know, if we're at someone else's house, I don't know the address necessarily. I don't know. Mm. So handle that for me, please. Call 911. Get, get help on the way. I'm going to handle the auto injector. We've got that. It, we don't need an audience. If someone else can think about it, get everyone else out of the room, especially mm -hmm. the other kids, because, you know, it could be scary. And, I mean, depending on how the symptoms come on. Mm -hmm. um, but those would be the things I would hope someone who has knowledge of, you know, where is the nearest hospital? You know, I mean, if you're far enough out, it might be faster to drive in than wait for the ambulance. And our families do live way out. Um, so that's what I personally would hope for. I guess that's the nature of a conversation, though, that any food allergy family would have to have with other people. Yeah, and yeah. you've hit on it right there. It is about communication. It is all about communication. I don't want people to make assumptions on anything. Ask us. Ask us about the foods. Ask us what we need. Ask how you can help. But it, it, it's about conversation. It's my responsibility to communicate to people what we need. And then I just need people to really respect and understand what we're asking for. Even if it seems like I am just a little bit obsessive over it, it's about the conversation and really listening. Yeah, and it seems to me there's something else as well, and that's trusting your expertise. They trusting your expertise. Mm -hmm. Because it seems there are things that may not make sense to somebody if they've not really been educated. And one of them is about the use of the auto injector. So you're the one who told me about the uh, importance of a universal symbol, mm -hmm. which is the fist going to the thigh, mm -hmm. uh, in much the same way that we have a signal for choking right now uh, to let people know we might be choking in a restaurant or in a, during a meal. Mm -hmm. This for somebody who's having a reaction, that may be the only thing they can do. They may not be able to speak. Mm -hmm. It may not be clear the nature of the seriousness of their reactions. Mm -hmm. So then... And, and here's one of the things that surprised me when I first learned about it, is that when you're using that auto injector, it goes through the person's clothing, even jeans. That's what I hear. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, I guess is a good thing because I don't necessarily want to be out in public and, you know, fumbling with jeans. But, you know, so, so many of us are used to an injection where it has to go mm -hmm. right into the, the bare skin. I could see someone not trusting your expertise, maybe getting in the way right. and trying to direct you to do it in a different way. Right. Yeah. When, in fact, I've heard s lectures from physicians who've said that when it's done to the bare skin, you risk a laceration injury. So. Oh. Oh my the child's really better off, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if you're holding them and you're administering the auto injector that way. Right. Yeah. And, and you're right. I could see how that would look funny to someone who wasn't aware of that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's another reason to ask everyone, give us space. Yeah. Well, you know, the family is such a basic unit of mm -hmm. connection. It's really where mm -hmm. we all start. And then, of course, it's our families who help us grow and connect with other um, people in our lives, whether it's school or church or mm -hmm. a neighborhood and, and so on. And so um, I want to think now about the families who choose not to travel or choose to avoid an extended family um, situation because it's just too much trouble. Um, do you know people like that who avoid it altogether? I do. It would seem to me that that must be very lonely. Yeah. Uh, again, we're, we're so very blessed. I can trust our family. 
and our family does work with us. So that is not our experience. Okay. Um, I mean, there have certainly been, you know, evenings out with friends or things that we've had to say no to, but by and large, that has not been our experience. We have not had to do that, but I'm sure there are people who do. Um, and I would think then that, again, since the holidays are one of the times when extended family gets together, this has a ripple effect mm -hmm. on other generations, on grandparents, mm -hmm. or increasingly now people are living longer, so great-grandparents, mm -hmm. who aren't going to get to see those kids. Sure. And with the challenges of separation and loneliness that we have in the in the country today and really other parts of the world as well, this would seem to be an important issue for everyone then to pay attention to. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, it really is. You know, and for us, um, travel is difficult. Um, it's not impossible. It is difficult, but you, we do it. Do you fly? We do. Um, I, I'm not going to say I haven't, you know, eaten through a few nails uh, on my way, you know, a little nervous, but we have found an airline that works for us. They do not serve peanuts on the flights, and they allow me to pre-board. So I'm getting on, I have gloves, I have wipes, I have wiped down everything, windows, lights. I mean, you have to think about everything people touch. Um, and then we have seat covers uh, that then ah, go on. Okay. So he never actually touches anything. Uh, but it does. Uh, fortunately, I'm able to pre-board. It takes me a good 10 minutes before I'm satisfied his seat. You know, my seat, my husband's seat. I mean, it, it, it's a few minutes. And you obviously make sure he has his auto injector with him. Absolutely. At least two. Yeah. Um, it's recently come to light that not all airplanes have auto injectors in their mm -hmm. medical kit. Mm -hmm. And there have been some unfortunate tragedies in the air in the last several months even yes, yeah, because of that. And uh, even in some cases where people had their own but needed more than the two that they were carrying, which is really very possible. Yes. Well, food allergies are certainly no joke. No. Uh, every three minutes, someone's heading to an ER because they're having an anaphylactic reaction. Uh, those reactions are everything from itching and hives and um, not being able to swallow, not being able to breathe, um, an incredible emotional sense of doom and something mm -hmm. being wrong, uh, all the way up to cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. So I can only imagine the sense of vigilance that a parent has to have. Yeah. Do you ever relax? Not really, no. <laughs> No, it is always there. Um, here's a, a, an example of just that, that constant thinking. My son and I were walking outside. I think we were at a street festival or something, and a, a person came down the road wearing a shirt uh, that was advertising peanut butter. And I instinctively put him on the other side of me. And after the person passed, we laughed about it, and I realized, okay, but it's just such a... Thing to me that it, it's it's constant vigilance that just seeing it advertised on a t-shirt was enough to invoke just a little flicker of unease. That sounds a bit like PTSD to me. <laughs> I don't know, but it's constant. Yeah, I, I hear that that can be the case, and particularly not only in the parent, but in the child, and if there's been a bad reaction. Right, and you know, that's, I try. I, I don't want my son to have the constant anxiety. I want him to be aware. I want him to be vigilant. I want him to make smart choices. I want him to live a good and happy, healthy life, too. Can he read a food label? He can. Well, at what age did that happen? How did you train him to do that? Oh, uh, you know, I mean, we were lucky. He was an early reader, oh. and he loved to read. So we just always did it, and he always saw us looking. And at this point, he, we double check everything. You know, I buy something in the grocery store, I've checked it in the grocery store, I bring it home, my husband goes to put it away and I see him looking at it. I see Riley reach into the pantry to take it out and I see him looking at it. And honestly, there have been times it's gone through me, it's gone through my husband and Riley goes, Mom, what were you thinking? So he's got it and he catches us and so it's at a third level, which is a really good thing. So yeah, always, always, always. And it is every label and it is every time because companies change ingredients and they change the, the process or the facility they're in. So just because we ate this today and it was fine and it was safe, that doesn't mean it's safe for him next week. So it's every label, every time. Yes, and um, that reminds me of something I talked with another food allergy mom about, which is Girl Scout cookies. 
I sold Girl Scout cookies myself <laughs> a long ago. I had no idea they were not all manufactured in one place. They're manufactured in different re facilities regionally, contracts with different bakeries. Mm -hmm. So a cookie that is safe in Manhattan may not be safe in Milwaukee. Right. So if you traveled for the holiday and somebody offered you what would have been a safe cookie in your neighborhood, it may not be a safe cookie there right. uh, as well. Right. Yeah, we've, he's never had a Girl Scout cookie. Um, but it, you know, it's not just Girl Scout cookies. That happens in the grocery store. You know, a brand that we can buy up here in Pennsylvania when we've traveled and gone on vacation or to visit family, it's not safe down there. So that it is literally every time mm -hmm. you check that label. Mm -hmm. Well, this sounds like a lot of work. And um, not just for the holidays, but for every day. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm sure that you think not only about what's happened in the past and what's going to happen today, but what might happen in the future. He's growing up, and he's going to be moving out and around further and further distant from your own supervision and assistance, and particularly as he goes to high school, especially as he goes to college. And um, so it's no surprise to me that I heard you had a meltdown in a grocery store. It was the frozen food section, if I recall <laughs> correctly. How does one have a meltdown in the frozen food section? Well, um, as I said, he had 11 months old. We knew about the peanuts and tree nuts, and we, we thought we had it figured out. We were used to it. And then it wasn't until he was, you know, about eight that we discovered the dairy. And so I had just learned this, and I'm shopping, and I've gotten through most of the store. It's been about an hour and a half with label reading, and I have exactly two things in my cart. And I was looking in the freezer and took out yet another thing that wasn't going to work. And I just remember slamming the freezer door and saying, somebody needs to open an allergy-friendly grocery store. His tears were probably running down my face. Um, I'd like to think some good came from my meltdown. Um, I swear I heard a voice whisper, well, you know, you're, you're somebody. Um, and so with my partner, uh, Karen DePache, we've actually opened an allergy-friendly grocery store called Allergy Orchard. So it was the, the product of a meltdown, but it, it can be overwhelming. I'd love to tell you that was the only meltdown I ever had, but we all know that wouldn't be the case. Your early career, you were a college professor, right? I was. You've come a long way to be in retail now, and you've certainly learned a lot as a food allergy mom. I have. It's been life-changing. Tammy? I really want to thank you for being here today. Um, I hope that everyone watching this will take this holiday as an opportunity to connect with friends and family living with food allergies. If you all agree to have food together, use this as a chance to, to create peace of mind for everyone while you enjoy each other's company over food. They'd rather not have food. Well, then just be glad they want to be together and celebrate in some other way. People with food allergies and their families, they need others as much as, frankly, we need them because we're all in this together. If Tammy or I can be in touch to help, uh, if Tammy or I can help, please be in touch and we will. This Thanksgiving, let's connect.